Column 1 is who you're mad at, person, institution, principal, anything that comes. Second column is why you're angry, upset or jealous or let down by if you've been around for a while. Third column is what areas of self were hurt, threatened, or interfered with. Seven areas, self-esteem, pride, ambition, personal relationships, sex relationships, security, and pocketbook. We've looked at the fourth column, where was I selfish, with an explanation. Checkmark doesn't work. And I'm going to share with you how important the fourth column is. Five steps come from the fourth column. Now, what do I mean by that? Everything you need for step five, everything you need for step six, everything you need for step seven, everything you need for step eight, and everything you need to sit in front of somebody to make amends comes from a clear fourth column. The exact nature of your wrongs, your defects, your shortcomings, the nature of the harm, and the clarity to make amends comes from the fourth column. That's how important the fourth column is. Check mark ain't going to do it. But if you get clear on where you were selfish, where you were self-seeking, where you were dishonest, how you were dishonest, any behavior that comes, if a behavior that you did with that person comes, you don't know what heading it goes under, just put it in there. Shunned, screamed at, yelled at, punched. You want to get down to the exact nature of the harm. Then it says, what about fear? That you mark the word fear next to the third column. Well, you're going to find fears throughout the third column, but they should all be correlated down at the bottom of the fourth column. So all you have to do to make your fear list is go to column four, get a blank piece of paper, and list the fears that are shown to you from the, from the four column inventory. But if I've been thorough with the four column inventory, all the fears are listed under afraid, the bottom of the fourth column. I make that list, I cross off the repeats. This short word somehow touches every aspect of our lives. Fear is an E, and it's important to know what it is again in this, in this section. Fear is an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of my existence is shot through with fear. Fear sets in motion trains of circumstances which brought my misfortune I feel I didn't deserve. But didn't, didn't I myself set the ball rolling? We think fear ought to be classed with stealing. Fear seems to cause more trouble than stealing. How do they, how do they, how do they fit fear with stealing? Well, they're not writing a book to kleptomaniacs who are powerless over stealing. They're writing a book to alcoholics who know damn well when they're stealing. Stealing is a conscious decision. So is fear. Fear is a conscious decision that I have made to rely on myself. And the next paragraph says, where, is it, where, where does it say, fear is because self-reliance failed? Ah, yes. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. That means I take them from the fourth column. I put them on paper. Some I might have, I pray a little bit. Some I might have that I don't even have resentment in connection with. So pray. You might not have snakes or spiders or being, well, you'll probably have being alone. But some of these funny fears, add those to your list. Some you might not have found in your resentment inventory. The column two of the fear inventory is we're going to ask ourselves why we're afraid. And then it says, isn't fear because self-reliance fails? Which leads me to believe that if I'm in fear, it's because I'm in self-reliance. This is one of the trickiest ones to see, but you can see it by doing this, this fear inventory, and this is the idea. Fear is because of self-reliance. That's hard to see. You would think that self-reliance would remove my fears and make them weaker. Self-reliance actually increases my fears. And fear is a conscious decision to rely on self rather than God with my fears. And if you want to do an interesting exercise the next time you have a fear list before you start to write the rest of it, look at the idea about self-reliance underneath each fear. 
So here's what I'd like to sh share with you. If resentment is a mask to hide fear, and all emotion are just masks to hide something, what is fear a mask to hide? Fear is a mask to hide self-reliance. So it's like an onion. We've started with who we're mad out here. We look at how it affects us in here. We look at our behavior that set the whole thing going. And now we're looking at what's underneath resentment is fear. We're going to a deeper level of the onion. Under every resentment is fear. You've seen that in the four-column resentment inventory. Every, every resentment led you to your fears. Now we're taking that next layer of fears and we're going to go deeper. And we're going to see that fear is a mask to hide my agnosticism and my reliance on self. What I do, all it really says in the book, all it really says in the book is to, um, on page 68, all it really says is to list your fears and ask you why you have them, ask yourself why you have them. So in the beginning, we used to just do two column fear inventory. I would take this big list of fears, I would call, cross off the repeats, I would end up with about 20 fears, but then you should start to think of the fear inventory like a playoff chart. You know, like in the basketball playoffs when they start with 64 teams and they get down to two? So what I do, if I have a big fear list, I do the second column, which is asking myself why I'm afraid of it. So let's say you have being alone. Why am I afraid of being alone? You know, if being alone was a pleasurable experience, I wouldn't be afraid of it. I'm afraid of being alone because it's painful. I'm afraid of rejection because it's painful. I'm afraid of drinking again because I'll die. I'm afraid of not drinking again because I'll have to be responsible. I'm afraid of being honest because it hurts me. I'm afraid of being dishonest because it hurts others. And I just start to break it down. And you'll find out, let's say you start with a list of 60 fears from your resentment inventory you'll find out that it's really only about 10 or 20. You do two columns on those fears, and you'll find out there's really only about 10. And when you get down to 10 negative fears, rejection, being alone, looking bad, pain, drinking, dying, not having any power, when you get your list down by this two-column process to 10 fears, Take those ten fears and their direct opposites, because believe it or not, you're as, as afraid of living as you are dying. You're afraid of pleasure as you are pain. You're afraid of being with someone as you are of being rejected. Take your ten negative fears and their opposites, so you got like a list of twenty, and do four columns on those twenty. And the only thing that's really different with the four-column fear inventory, when you get it broken down, is that the only thing that sounds different if you're doing the extended third column is that self-esteem with fear is not about I am. It's about I can. So how might that sound? Let's say you've, you've, so here's how it might go. You've got a huge resentment inventory. You've got fears at the bottom of each fourth column. You've taken all those fears and you've put them on a list on a new pad. You've crossed off all the repeats. You've gotten down to 60 fears. You do two columns on those. By that I mean column two would be why. You see that you're really not afraid of 60 things. You're really only afraid of about 15. You break those down. You get to about 10 negative fears. Take their opposites, and there's your new list. 10 negative and 10 positive fears. Living, dying. Being with someone, being rejected. Pain, pleasure. Living, dying. Having power, not having power. Take those 20 fears and start with the first one. So that would be column one. I'm afraid of pain. Why? Column two, I'll drink. Affects my self-esteem, pride, ambition, security, personal relations. I'm afraid of pain because it will take me back to a drink. Self-esteem, I can control pain. Ambition, I mean pride, no one should see me in pain or that I can't control it. Ambition, I want to be able to play God and control pain. Uh, security. I need to be free of pain to be okay. I have a mind that tells me you cannot be at peace and in pain at the same time. Yes, you can. All over AA, they say you can't be in fear and faith. 
They've just told you the only time you need faith, you can't be in it because you're in fear. You better believe you can be in fear and there's faith. That's when I need it. That's like the parking lot, God. God loves me today because there was a parking place outside the meeting just for me. That's a great tool the ego is using to set you up for the day there's no parking place. And the day you pull up and there's no parking space, God, your ego says, God doesn't love you today. There's no parking place. Huh? Or God loves me today because I'm comfortable most of the time. That's a great setup the ego's using to set you up for a day when you're not comfortable. And your ego goes, ah, God don't love you today, but I know what will love you down there at the store. God can be in the middle of the pain. And believe it or not, and I've experienced this, you don't need to get out of the pain before you can be at peace. Because then all you've done is turn AA into a drug that just takes, it's just a pain management class. And believe it or not, some of you young people won't want to believe this, but every one of us is going to have physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual pain. And if all you do is learn how to do 10 and 11 to get out of pain, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional, you'll never get free. You can get free in the middle of pain without having to get free of the pain before you're back to peace. You might be in pain for a long time, physically. You might have chronic back pain the rest of your life. Can God be there in the middle of that? Can you find peace in the middle of pain? Because, see, that's the pattern of addiction I brought to the program. And the belief system was, if I'm in pain, any kind of pain, if I'm in pain, I have to do something to get out of the pain before I'll be back to peace. That's addiction. And I was always doing something to avoid pain. It's not very healthy. So I end up with these ten negative fears and these ten positive fears. And I write four columns. When I'm afraid of pain, because it will take me back to a drink, and I have these beliefs my ego are telling me in the third column, when I'm in that pain, what do I do? Column four, selfish. Avoid it. Deny it. It's dishonest. I don't talk about it. I try to get out of it using this and this or sex or money or food. Where am I selfish with this fear? What do I do when I'm in that fear that's selfish? What do I do when I'm in that fear that's self-seeking? What do I do? I use people. I use things. Where am I dishonest about the fear? I think I can control it. I think I can fix it. I think I can make it go away. And what's the real fear? The real fear under my pain of the real fear under my fear of pain of drinking again is that I might not drink again. And then the, the fear inventory starts to turn into a circle. And you'll see that you're just afraid of having power as you are of remaining powerless, if not more. That great Nelson Mandela poem, we're more afraid of the light than we are the truth. We're more afraid of having power than we are remaining powerless. See, wouldn't it be easy for, the, for all of us in this room to just spend the rest of our sobriety saying to people, oh, I'm, what do you expect from me? I'm powerless and my life is unmanageable. We expect a special clause on the IRS form, the alcoholic clause, <laughs> why I shouldn't have to pay. You, know. you tell your wife, what do you expect from me? I wanted to choke my boss today. I'm just an alcoholic. When do you stand up and claim spiritual progress? When do you claim the power of God in your life? When do you stand up and say, I've got enough power to manage my life with God? When do you stand up and start to experience the 10th and 11th step promises about proper use of the will, about exercising your willpower along certain lines? Why have so many of us in this room been to so many meetings on the 9th step promises? Because a lot of people get halfway through the 9th step. But how many of us have ever been in meetings on the 10th and 11th step promises? Because people don't get through amends. They don't enter the world of the Spirit. They don't know what it's like having power. And a lot of us don't know that at some point, this book addresses people who suffer from lack of power, and then it shifts and it, start to, it starts to address a person that's been given some power. We see the futility of our fears and we begin to outgrow them. I am not dominated by fear anymore. And I'm not dominated by a belief system that says i got to get out of the pain before I can be at peace. Because then you're just avoiding pain. So I do four-column fear inventory. Then it says to make a list of relationships. 
I don't believe the sex inventory is just about people you've had sex with. But that just might be a cop out because of my age and that I've been celibate for a while until last year. <laughs> I put the most important. Rela- I think the inventory says that we subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? You want a challenge? A woman came up to me at the sc- at Scary Frank's meeting in Denver, and she said to me, "What's the most important relationship in your life?" And I had the audacity to say, "My relationship with God." And you know what she said? Have you ever answered the nine questions in the sex inventory about your relationship with God that you say is the most important relationship in your life? And I put God as a heading, and I answered the nine questions from the sex inventory. It hammered me. I have people now that are in monogamous relationships with one person. They write about their relationship with their wife. They write about their relationship with fantasy. They write about their relationship with masturbation. They write about their relationships with themselves. And they write about their relationship with God and answer those nine questions. The first one, it's good enough if you can get to a a list of your major relationships. Sometimes they'll just be a memory. You won't even have a name. You know, the girl in Saigon. I was never in Saigon, but that's... uh, You might not have a name to put down with it. Put it down if it comes. Put all the major relationships you've been in. And in paragraph form, this is what I ask people to do. Review the relationship. How it started, how it went, where it ended, or where it is now. Oh, when I first met her, it was only about this, and I only cared about this, and I wanted this, and we got together, and we lived together, and we got engaged, and then it went like this, and then she left, and that's where it is now. And uh, that's just in paragraph form. And then go to the book, and in paragraph form, it doesn't have to be in columns, answer the nine questions. So what are the nine questions? Page six. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I got confused once, and I, Joe and Charlie tell this. I thought the instructions for the sex inventory were on 96 rather than 69. So I went to 96, and it said, don't be discouraged if your prospect doesn't respond at once. Search out another woman and try again. You're sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. We find it a waste of time to chase a man or a woman who cannot or will not work with you. Then I was told, no, it's on page 69. I thought, oh, that's an appropriate number. It says, you review your conduct over the years past. I make my list. I write the hist- and then I take the first name off my list. I put it on a piece of paper and I write about the history of that relationship. I turn the page over usually or another page and then I answer these questions. Where was I selfish? With an explanation. That's one. Two, where was I dishonest? Three, where was I inconsiderate? Four, who else was hurt? Look around the relationship. She might not have been the only one hurt. Her mom and dad were hurt. Kids. Her other husband. Ooh. Where did you arouse jealousy? Number one, two, three, four. Number five. Number six, where did you arouse suspicion? Number seven, where did you arouse bitterness? Number eight, where were you at fault? Sums up the whole thing. And number nine, what should you have done instead? Circle the word should. Keep in mind it doesn't say could. You probably couldn't have done anything better with what power you had, but there's probably some things you should have done. One was selfish. Two was dishonest. Three was inconsiderate. Four was who was hurt. Five was jealousy. Six was suspicion. Seven was bitterness. Eight was where was I at fault. And number nine was what should I have done instead. It doesn't say could. It says should. From question number nine, you're going to find your ideal for the future. This ideal is overlooked. Some people mention three inventories, but they overlook the ideal for the future. My book tells me that in writing this, I'm trying to shape a sane and sound ideal for the future. It tells me how to find that ideal. It tells me I choose it. It tells me I can ask God to help mold it. It tells me what will happen if I don't live up to it. It tells me what will happen if my conduct continues to hurt others. It'll also tell me what will happen if I'm sorry and I, and I ask for forgiveness. But it'll also tell me what will happen if I don't live up to this chosen ideal. I'm quite sure to drink. 
So we pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. It's funny that the only part of this process up to this point that my sponsor warned me about was writing an ideal for the future. And he said, because of what the book says, the last line on page 69 not God alone can judge our sex situation. The line before that, um, in other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. We ask in meditation what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. It also talks about letting God take you to better things. That blew my mind. You mean in, the, in my sex life, God could take me to better things than I could? God has a better idea for my sex life than I do? God is interested in my sex life? God can take me to something better than I can. But the only part of this process that Don ever warned me about was to not write out the ideal if I didn't want to see that area of my life change. I can also tell you this. Don't write an ideal for a saint. Don't write an ideal to please your sponsor. Write an honest ideal from your own heart. Hey, you want to be single and have fun, non-harmful, non-selfish? That should be your ideal. Write an ideal that you can live up to with God. And it should sound like from, and look back to, 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 to shape a sane and sound ideal for the future, use question number nine as a guide. And it should be in paragraph form. It's the only piece of inventory that I keep after my amends cards are filled out. I keep my ideal and I look at it once in a while to see if it's what I still want to live up to. I finally wrote one after 20 years that I had the power to live up to. And that's to be with someone that I love. And I am. But that's the only part of this work so far that he warned me about. He said, if you do not want that area of your life to change, don't choose an ideal for the future. Uh, Two other things that I haven't mentioned that are worth mentioning about inventory is that you watch for two things. If during any of the inventory, usually happens in the fourth column, usually happens where you're looking at your part, be very careful you don't fall into beating yourself up. Oh, what a rotten, terrible, look at all this that I've done, and you're beating yourself up because the ego has won. The ego wins if it convinces you you're no good, and it wins if it convinces you the best. It wins either way. I'm the greatest boyfriend in the world is ego. I'm the worst boyfriend in the world is the same ego. So if you start to beat yourself up when you're discovering truth, go back to the statement before inventory. Our troubles are of our own making. Stay with it for a couple days until you can get back to that hopeful statement, the good side to that statement. Thank God my troubles with her of my own making, because if they're of her making, she's going to have to do something for me to get free. Get back in that positive side to that statement and then go back into the fourth column. The other thing you have to watch out for, which is even even just as dangerous, is that when you're discovering truth, your ego will start to play a different game. And that's the, so now I'll just become, and you start to create yourself in your own image. You know, you, you write an inventory and you go, my God, I've been such a whore. And then you, you wake up the next morning, you're going to be a nun. <laughs> yeah. Or I've been such a, I've been so aggressive, so... I think next week I'll go take a course on being gentle. That's just creating yourself in your own image, a whole new third column belief system. And it has nothing to do with what God might want. Maybe God wants you to remain a whore. Right? How do I know? He was great friends with Mary Magdalene, right? I don't know what God wants. So be careful. Be careful not to begin to, to play the so now I'll game. Because then, if you can, and we do this thing, Mark and I, I wish we had time today, but we don't. Mark and I do this thing that was shared with us called Theater of the Lie. But I can paint the picture for you. If we would have brought a guy up here and sat him right here and had him put on the board a resentment, I'm resentful at Sally for leaving me, we could have brought the committee that's involved in that one-act play and stood them all around him. What would that have looked like? So you ask Mark, you ask him, who were you mad at? No, I'm sorry. Who was mad when she left you? He goes, what do you mean, who was mad? Who was mad when she left? I don't know what you mean, who was mad. 
Who was mad? Then a little anger will come out and they'll go, well, you know, I am a CEO of a company. Oh, let's bring up Mr. CEO. Well, you know, I do have a reputation in the, oh, Mr. AA. Well, you know, I am kind of a Romeo, but let's bring up. And by the time you're done, you got about 10 people standing around him that we call the committee. Mr. AA, the CEO, the, the unworthy son, Rambo, Romeo. <laughs> And then you bring her up, you bring her up, the girl that left him because he cheated. You bring her up and you say, who was, who was affected when he cheated on you? Who do you mean who was affected? I was. Who? Well, you know, I am a pretty important businesswoman with a five-year plan and I am a progressive woman of the new millennium. You bring the businesswoman up and Juliet and the whore and the sex kitten and Miss AA and the, the unworthy daughter. And by the time you're done, you got about ten people standing around her. And then you say, now I'm going to show you why you're having trouble with personal relationships. <laughs> and remember, this is when you're not at one. She's mad because he cheated, and he's mad because she left. And you ask each one of them. And you say, here's why you're having trouble with personal relationships. If the businesswoman wakes up to, the, to Romeo, there's a big problem because he wants to make love. She's got a 9 o'clock appointment. Now, if Juliet wakes up to the businessman, they got a problem because he's got a nine o'clock appointment and she wants to make love. And the only time you have a good day when you're not at one is when the two right personalities wake up at the same time. <laughs> Romeo has to wake up to Juliet and it gets funnier and funnier and funnier. And then you ask, how did Rambo feel when she left? I wanted to kill her. How did Mr. A.A. feel? Live and let live. How did... <laughs> huh? And not only, not only do they each have different turns at chairing the committee at different mornings, they each have different beliefs about how they felt when she left. And that's why I'm having trouble with personal relations. And then you go, and you start to discover truth, and then Romeo goes, oh my God, I've been such a, a wuss, I'm going to become like Rambo. And you show how they just get up and change seats. They never get smashed. You know. Rambo needs to become a little more passive. Mr. AA Mr. needs to become a little more aggressive. Rambo become, you know, and they all just get up and change seats. They never get smashed. And then Frank would tell us this story about a man that he watched go through this on his deathbed. And this was a man that became victim of a belief that I think is really dangerous that a lot of us have just accepted. And you know what the belief is? Never say no to an AA request. That kills people. That precludes your wife, your children, your job, prayer, God, meditation, intuition. And this guy became an AA speaker. He didn't do much work with the steps, but he became the speaker in Denver. And he couldn't say no to an AA request. And the doctor told him one day, you better be at the hospital tomorrow at 4 o'clock because we got to take your appendix out quick. And he couldn't show up because he had to speak at a meeting. And his appendix burst at the podium. And he's in the, is in the hospital dying of peritonitis that they couldn't do anything about back then. And Frank went to see him each day. And he said for 17 days it took this man to die. And each day when he was lucid a little bit, another personality would come out and he would say things like, you know, I wasn't the greatest husband in the world. But I wasn't the worst either. And another one would die. And I wasn't the greatest father in the world, but you know I wasn't the worst. And another one of these personalities would die. And Frank would say, we get to do that right here. And he had to do it on his deathbed. And that's what you face. These personalities that will just drive you into the ground. The reason I'm not at one. And you end the theater of the lie with, um, if this is when we're not at one, how do you get to oneness? You get to one by atoning, and that's what amends are about. So you start to admit the truth in five, six, seven, eight, nine. These personalities get smashed. They will reassert themselves. But in that state, when these personalities are repressed, there's no such thing as relationships. And everybody in the room that's been working on their relationship goes into shock because they said, if this is what we do when we're not at one, when we are at one, there's nothing but equanimity, love, compassion, and understanding for everyone. Some people you know better than others, but there's no such thing as individual relationships when you're at one. And he said, have you ever been at a party or at home with your parents when you're in the same room with your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, and your lover? And you're usually a really outgoing guy, but you can't say a word because you've got a different belief system and a different role with each relationship. And you, and you can't say a word. These personalities begin to get smashed in five through nine. 
That's how deadly it is. The resentment inventory is important. It will take you to nothing but lies until you start to see the fourth column. Believe it or not, nothing in the first three columns are true. And that's, people tend to miss, to miss, to miss, um, to miss how powerful inventory is because it's such a simple format. The idea that I can go home and put somebody's name, what they did, how it affects me, and how I played a part. And here's how powerful inventory is. It can take stuff you've thought were true your entire life and turn it into a lie. And it can take the lie that you didn't have anything to do with it and turn it into the truth. You want to know when the fourth column has worked? When it turns the first column into a lie. Now, how does that sound? If you would have asked me for a week, a month, or a year, were you hurt when she left you? I would say, of course I was. Well, why were you mad? Because she left me. Is that the truth? Yeah. Is that the truth? Yeah. Is that the truth? Yeah. Are you willing to bet your life on it? Yes. I'm mad because she left me. And then you write the third column, and then you start to move into the truth, and you're writing the fourth column, and you're writing the fourth column, and they're writing your fourth column, and then all of a sudden you go, oh my God, I'm not mad at her for leaving me. I'm mad at myself for driving her away. I did everything I could. I might as well have opened the back door, packed her bags, and kicked her ass out. That's the freedom. That's the power of inventory. And I would have sworn my whole life, I would have given up my whole life, believing that I was mad at her for leaving me. The first two columns aren't even true. You're going to find if the fourth column really works, and this is what I've been doing lately, stay in the fourth column until it turns the first two columns into a lie. Rewrite the first two columns, and you'll find every one of them is toward yourself or God. Take those. You'll have about five or ten toward yourself. You'll have about five or ten toward God. Do four columns on those. I dare you. That's, that is an inventory that will kick your ass. I, had, I was telling Dave at lunch, I had a 35-page resentment inventory in India about two, three years ago. Started with three people. They all pooped out when we got to inventory. There I am by myself. And it's not like here. I didn't have anybody to go to. I had nothing but drunk people trying to get sober in treatment. I didn't have people been doing the work or even AA members. So here I am with this inventory. I had 35 pages of resentment inventory, and it was one of these where it was not touching me. Some of you know what's that like. The writing doesn't touch you, but when you read it, it smashes you, or vice versa. It hammers you while you're writing it. By the time you read it, it's, you could be reading a comic book to your sponsor. Sometimes it happens in both writing and reading. Well, I had 35 pages of resentment inventory, and I used other words to get to the list. Jealous, let down by, discouraged with. I don't live with deep-seated resentment. But I had 35 pages of inventory. The fourth column was clear. And it wasn't touching me at all. I was just like, who am I writing about here? Whose story is this? And I heard this voice from the past, Scary Frank, once again in my mind. And he would say, the first three columns are all a lie. Well, I've seen the lies in the third column. They were obvious. I'm this, I'm that, I need this, she should be. I saw the lies, but I didn't see the lies in the first two columns. Because I still saw, I still thought some of them were who I was mad at and why I was mad. I hear this voice. I had this memory of some like she left me, but I really saw her. she didn't. I drove her away. But then I did it for every one of them. And what I did was it's a very simple process. If you get it, do it on your next inventory. Stay in the fourth column until it turns the first two columns into a lie. Rewrite the first two columns at the bottom. Every one of them will be toward you or God. Take those, cross off the repeats. You'll end up with a five or ten toward yourself, five or ten toward God. Take those as a new first and second column and do four columns on those resentments toward yourself and God. That'll be an inventory that brought me to the core of what was going on. When I read it to Mark Houston, he said I didn't even need to read the first 35 pages, that that would help me with my amends, but that the last 12 pages, the ones toward myself and God, was an inventory like he never heard. And I've seen several people do it now. Um, and they, they had an inventory like they never experienced. I think it's just another level. 
And I think the magic of the fourth column is that it turns the first three columns into nothing but lies that, that I base my life on. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's take a break till 4.15 and 